And she is not That's just, right. <laughs> she's not just my wife. She's my very best friend. And she, I would rather spend time with this woman. And matter of fact, I miss it when I'm not with her. And so I want to talk that's about... That's why I'm standing here right now. That's why yeah. I know. <laughs> I, I'm too insecure to come out here without her. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to give you just a few principles that we have found in our marriage, but apply to practically every relationship. And just want you to think about these as you go into your ministry. Uh, if you're a clergy couple, certainly they apply. Mm -hmm. But they apply to all of us in our relationships. And, and by the way, we speak from the ideal. We don't, sp we don't problem solve. That's not where we live. Um, and and w there are people who do problem solve who are very valuable to the body of Christ. The counselors, uh, the, the folks that, that, that walk with you through various issues and all that kind of we stuff. We pray for them. We pray for them, absolutely. <laughs> That's our part. Because we're, just not, we're not wired like that. But, but, we, but we live, literally live the ideal. And so we want to challenge you um, to do the same thing. First of all, in 43 years of marriage, we have never fought. That's true. Now, I want, to I want to tell you why. You're going, Ooh. right away, they're fake. <laughs> fake, 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 fake. No. I'll tell you, it's, it's mostly due to Becky, because I grew up in a family where fighting was the main form of intimacy. It was, the, it literally was the only way you could engage someone else fully and have their full attention. And so Becky grew up in the Ozzie and Harriet Nelson I family. I really did. And she just said, no. Life's too short. Now, let me tell you, one reason we don't fight is because she does not try to manage me. She tells me her opinion, which, by the way, is the biblical role of a wife. If you read in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 2.18, where God says, it's not good the man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Hebrew word for helper is one who talks back got that down. That's, 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 that's literally the, Hebrew, the definition of a wife, one who talks back to her husband, but not contentiously. Um, Becky was, the, was the, uh, the president of Global Pastors Wives Network uh, for uh, three years, and she went to 39 countries, and she um, um, talked to pastor's wives in every one of those countries. And, and our story is not necessarily their story because there's always this need to guide and manage the other person in any relationship, man, woman, any relationship. This isn't gender specific. This is a human trait. Do you, do you remember the Sri Lanka? Oh, yeah. This was, this was it so encapsulated the whole point. I was in Sri Lanka. I was talking to a group of pastor's wives, and the question of headship came up, and this woman said, I keep telling him how to, you know, he needs to be the head. I keep trying to get him to be the head. And uh, I said, you know, I don't think that really it's our job to tell our husbands to be the head. I said, it's really not our jobs to tell our husbands what to do, period. This lady puts her hand up and she goes, well, how's he going to know what to do? <laughs> there lies the problem. <laughs> So Becky tells me what she thinks once. Now I gotta tell you, that creates a lot of pressure for me because this is the smartest woman I know. I mean, literally the smartest woman I know. And so if I don't agree with her, I better have really good reasons or the voice of God backing me up. But she just leaves it. She leaves it at that. And so we really don't quarrel. Let me tell you something else we've learned. We've been through quite a bit in our life, as, as many of you have. Um, we had a little granddaughter that died um, of a brain tumor at five years old. Our middle son um, committed suicide. Um, unbeknownst to us, he was, a, he was a, an addict. He was an alcoholic. Um, and he was, a, at the same time, one of the premier pastors in this city. He built one of the largest churches in this city, uh, and it continues to be one of the largest churches in this city. But um, it drove him into the kind of depression and despair, and, and he, he just couldn't live with the life that he had, uh, he had built. When we went through that, it was such a shock to us. We have never had a drop of alcohol in our home. We've, it was so foreign to us. We couldn't, 
you know, we couldn't, we, it was like walking through the fog, you know. But, but Becky learned a principle along the way that has, that has, that has held us in good stead. You want to tell the principle? Yeah, I, um, I was a biology teacher by profession, and I loved science my whole life because I feel like it's such a reflection of what God's doing in heaven. I think that what we see here is we can learn principles that are spiritual principles, so I'm always looking for those. And I noticed when people were sick, years ago, if somebody had their claw bladder taken out, they're in the hospital 10 days, don't move, you know, whatever you do. And um, now, you know, you can have your brain removed and they say, get up tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's such a change in how that's all done. And I thought, why would this be any different? I thought, it, there's that moment when you cannot move. There's that moment after surgery, you cannot move. But way before you think you're ready to get out of that bed, they're in there going, hey, hey, up in the hall, let's walk it. And I thought, why would it be any different? And so the morning after our son died, we literally got out of our bed and did our routine, which is walking four miles around the lake. And um, it, it didn't feel good, but we honestly think by moving forward, continuing to move forward and just doing what we could do, not what we felt like doing, but what we could do, actually speeded the healing tremendously. It's, it's, it, you're stronger than you think. You're, you're really stronger are. than you feel. Mm -hmm. God's strength is more capable than you can possibly imagine until you have to go through what you go through, and then you can imagine it because there it is. And when, like a physical trauma, when you get out of bed, not only does it speed the recovery time, but it diminishes the, the, the chances for complications to set in, and it also creates what you've just been through. It creates a perspective for that. And so Becky, the next morning, looked at me and said, the devil's not going to win. Let's get up. We're walking. Four o'clock in the morning, we were walking. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so trauma needs to be faced, but it also needs to be conquered. And we've learned that in our relationship, and that's a part of the way we love each other. You know, you've got it in your relationships, don't you? When, when one's a little weak, the other's pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And when the other's a little weak, the other's pretty strong. That's why God gave us to each other. Um, and, so, and so, another point we've learned. Uh, let, me, let me go to uh, another one, because... We've made so many mistakes in our life. We don't go back and we don't go back and analyze it. We're not we backward. Don't. We're not back. No, hey, we're what's forward that, looking. What's oh, that animal? Emus. Do you know about the emu? The emu cannot walk backward. Now, here's what's weird about that. It can't go backward, but they don't know why. Its body is made in such a way it should be able to back up, but it can't. I've decided again, spiritual principle. I'm an emu. I can't walk backward. Don't know why. Glad for it but I got to be going forward in a spiritual sense. So that emu that I taught my high school kids about years ago has proved to be a very helpful tool in my, in my perspective. You can imagine the hours of needless self-doubt and needless analysis uh, that we have avoided, just mired in, because here's, here's, here's a secret everybody knows. You don't know what you don't know. You, you can't go back and figure it out. I can't figure, figure out. You couldn't figure it out when you're going through it. How do you figure it out going back? I mean, really? Exactly. Exactly. I'm sure every counselor out here is just wanting Yeah, to I know. The counselor going, oh, wait. You know, we pray for maybe you, you can. Remember, we I do can. pray for you. I haven't got the time. <laughs> Come on, I got stuff to do. So, that, and, Here's and a, by the, oh, I got it. I just saw oh, yeah, this. Go, yeah. I saw it on Pinterest, but it's awesome. Do, <laughs> Don't trip over anything behind you. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, Pinterest wisdom. <laughs> There's got to be a proverb that fits that. Look it up. Yeah. The, l l let me go on. Uh, the, 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 um, we don't freak out. When, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, we, we, don't, we don't worry. T tell, them about that. tell them about your theory about worry. Oh, worry. Oh, this will help you. If you're a worrier... She's a little slow. 
<laughs> oh, word. <laughs> it's okay. We got Go on. No, this is so great. Um, a pastor's wife shared with me, this with me when I was in my 20s, and she said, she said, Becky, are you, do you worry about things now and then? I'm like, well, yeah, I do sometimes. And she said, you know God says not to worry. And I thought, I know. And sometimes for like 20 minutes, I won't worry. But normally, I'm in worry mode. She said, let me help you with that. She said, do you have a real God? I said, yes. And she said, when you worry, you go into your imagination, into a little fake world you create, and you invent little things that are out there in your little fake world, it's the only time God won't go with you. You have a real God. He goes into your real world. If every single thing you worry about happened, he'd be there with you. You wouldn't be alone. But you worry, and you're alone in that worry. It isn't really helps. Isn't it amazing? A real God can't go into an imaginary world. And so, and so the, you, Scripture's really clear on this. Be anxious for nothing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will make your path straight. We don't worry. We trust God. Here's the, here's the deal. And you know this especially when you've gone through traumatic or horrible events. You either trust God or you don't. You either mm -hmm. trust God or you don't. And if you trust God, you know that a real God is going to be working in all things for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Right. And so God could have prevented that. He did not. And it may be way beyond our imaginings, especially when we've prayed the other way, especially when we thought we knew the will of God, but apparently had a plan larger than ours. No, he always has a plan larger than ours. You either trust God or you don't. There's another, there's another uh, uh, um, tendency. We, we, this is really funny because Becky, Becky and I are wired just the opposite, as most of you are. If you have friends, that God made us to be enough like each other to be intimate, but different enough to be necessary. That's, that's also, I haven't, I haven't got the time to take you through the creation story, but that's exactly, well, let me just, let me do this. <laughs> just, in Genesis 2.18, he not only says, I will make him a helper suitable for him, but you remember the next part of that. The next part of that, he doesn't make the he didn't make the woman right away. He parades all the animals before the man. Why? Because he's looking for a date. The man's looking for a date. Some of you single people know what this is like. Whole line of animals. And there is not one found suitable for you. He's not just naming them Aardvark. He's saying, Aardvark. But see the Aardvark can't respond to, can't answer him back, can't talk back. So the aardvark is not enough like him to be intimate. Now watch. So when he makes the woman out of the man, the Bible says he brings her to the man. Now what, what just happened? She's enough like him to be intimate. Watch this. But different enough. This, this is a great pageant of a wedding. The Father God is bringing the bride to the man. Brings her to the man. Why? Because she was in a different place. She had a different perspective. He needed a different perspective. And that's why he needed her. And she needed him. So we're wired differently. Becky has always been, her, her, her motto has always been safety first. You know? Safety first. My motto has always been, change the world. If you die, you die. <laughs> no. And we don't fight. Is that amazing? <laughs> so, so anyhow, it, it, we've been a good balance. And, and, uh, and, 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 but here's, here's the deal. Becky has this motto. And her motto is, in order to be brave for the long haul, you have to risk in the moment. 
even someone with safety first as a, as a uh, and, and let me tell you a story. The story goes along with this. <laughs> you know, many of you have been to Africa, and, and when you go, uh, sometimes you're fortunate to have times to, to go into the great Grand game preserves. And, you know, so we were in Atosha, it's in, the, in Namibia, um, and, and we were going to Atosha. And as we were going, you know, we were all excited because there was lions in there and, you know, all kinds of dangerous man-eating beasts. And, and, and all, of the, all of the signs were, keep, your, keep all limbs inside. Don't open the window any more than one inch. Keep, stay inside your bed. Sign after sign after sign. There's like six of us in this, in this van, you know, and, and so, you know, we get to Otosha, and the guide says, did you read the signs? You know, yeah. yeah. You know, and of course, Becky's, I mean, she's just crying. Uh. So we start proceeding through the thing, you know, and we're starting to see all these animals. And all of a sudden, we hear this, bam! Mm, 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 mm. And then another, Bam! <laughs> Two tires had blown. The guy stops the car and says, okay, everybody out. <laughs> Becky said, I'm not kidding now. <laughs> it wasn't because she was afraid. It's because she's a rules person. That's right. The rules said, the sign said you don't get out. And the guy said, you got to get out or we're never going to get out of here. And so the, the point is we can, we can want to stay safe in this world. We can't stay safe in this world. It is the strategy of long-term bravery that makes us have to come out for short-term risk. Now, one more. Both of us know. He, see, this is... We, our relationship is about mission. It's always been about mission. Um, um, I've never been... And Becky can tell you this. I'm romantically challenged. I don't even know the first thing about how to do it. I don't know how to do it. It's not because... because be, I to put be, on his calendar. It's my birthday... She does. She does. She puts it on my calendar. Puts it on. It's our anniversary, you know, so that I can't fail. She I sets don't want up, him failing. I don't want him failing. She, does, she, she just sets it up so I don't have to fail. And because and, to be romantic, you really have to remember details. I'm not a detail person. I mean, Becky said another reason we need each other, she's a detail person. I say, we're going to conquer the world. And she says, all right, that's wonderful. What would be our first step? And I say, there are steps. <laughs> you know, I'm tied to reality by a kite string. And so, and so, and so this is, but, but God put us together for mission. Here's what we understand. Your relationships are never about your relationships. Your relationships are always about what God's going to do through your relationships to impact the rest of the world because he loves them as much as he loves you. Our marriage has never been about our marriage. We have never, I've never stared into her eyes and, and do whatever romantic people, I don't know, eating bonbons or what, I don't even know what romantic people do. I don't know. <laughs> never you know at done. our wedding, you know at weddings you stand and you do this thing, like, like, yes I do, and then you go like this and walk down the aisle. The part we loved about our wedding was the walk down the aisle. Right. Let's drop one hand, get going, let's do this thing. And that was our mindset from day one. And that when we do weddings, oh my goodness, that is so the part we love. It's the minute they drop the one hand and walk together to go do something great for God. It's exactly awesome right. Thing. Exactly right. And ironically, that has given us more warmth and more intimacy and more deeper friendship and a better romance then the whole bonbon thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do they, what are bonbons? I don't even know what bonbons are. It just sounded right. Anyhow, the thing, though, that is important 
for all of us that want close relationships is that it is never about the mechanics. It is always about the person. It's always about the person. When we were in, 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 in ministry, um, uh, first in ministry, well, we've done this our whole life. Because we like to hang out together and because, you know, we strategize and we, you know, we, we, uh, when I went to the hospital to visit uh, folks, uh, she would uh, pack up our boys. Uh, we were in Indiana at the time. It was cold. She'd pack them up and, you know, and she'd ride along with me just so that we could be together. And she'd stay down and, and read to them in the waiting room. And then we'd go to another hospital and same thing. When she went to the store, I went with the boys, you know. And if she just needed to go in for a little while, then, then the boys and I would be in the car because we wanted the ride with her more than we wanted the free time. And so anyhow, this one time we, we go to the store. Beck says, I'll just be a minute. And at that time, we had, um, was it just two kids or we had the third? We just it was Jolene. Okay, just we just had the two kids. And, and our oldest one uh, has always been, you know, like tremendously analytical, always wanted to know how things worked. And, and, our, and our middle son was always, you know, touchy feely, you know, huggy, you know. And so, and so I'm sitting there, and the middle one crawls on my lap, and and he, he sees himself in a mirror. And I had mirror sunglasses on, and she starts making, totally forgot I was behind, <laughs> the, behind the glasses. Um, um, anyhow, uh, um, Josh dives under the, the, the um, um, dashboard and, and starts playing with the fuses. And, and, and it gets better. <laughs> And he's saying, Dad, how does this work? Well, I don't know. I haven't got a mechanical bone in my body. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think, is Josh old enough to start noticing girls? Now, now fathers, you have to watch this because if you have sons, you want to have the talk before someone else has the talk. But you don't want to have it so soon that it just grosses them out and they just, oh, <laughs> You know, so I'm trying to figure out, okay, has he started noticing girls? Well, he pops up, and he has, a, he has something in his hand, a fuse in his hand. <laughs> and he looks out, and out from the store comes this gorgeous, drop-dead little girl, little curly hair, <laughs> little patent leather shoes with lacy things. He'd never seen anything like that. And he looked at her, and she she, she climbed on this bike, and there was a streamers on the bike, little pink bike, shiny, had a little bag, you know. And I thought, well, there's the answer to my, there's the answer to my question. She rode that bike, rode it right in front of our car. He never blinked. I worried about his eyes drying out. <laughs> he ne I was looking at him the whole time. Never blinked. She finally rode past and disappeared around the corner. He looked at me and he said, Dad, did you see that? I looked at him and I said, see what? He said, did you see that bike? <laughs> I knew he wasn't fully mature yet. And it's the same way with spiritual maturity. If you're not fully mature yet, you're always worried about the mechanics. You're always worried about the, the technical details. When you're mature, you focus on people. You love people. Your heart's for people. You notice people. Let me pray for us, okay? Lord, thank you. Thank you for focusing on us. Thank you for becoming a person. Thank you for showing us your incarnate love. And thank you for dying on the cross mm -hmm. that we might forever have a relationship personally with you, have intimacy with you. And we ask you today to help us love like Jesus loved. 
to not notice the unimportant stuff so that we can dwell on the important stuff. And that is the people and their heart and their dreams and their faith. We thank you for the relationships you've given us. We thank you how encouraging they are. And we ask you to help us to be encouragers for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.